John Wayne faced two memorable encounters with Dirty Harry. Most Wayne fans know that John Wayne turned down the title role in the Dirty Harry film series. It would turn out to be his biggest lost opportunity, making Clint Eastwood a superstar and earning millions at the box office. Wayne's lesser-known encounter with Harry came roughly 20 years earlier when he stood on the hallowed grounds of Snow Canyon, Utah, filming an epic called The Conqueror. Caked in nuclear fallout from an atomic blast named Dirty Harry, many suggest this encounter would prove even more troubling. Some say it may very well have cost him his life. When John Wayne died on June 11, 1979, at the age of 72, he was the last of the major players in the saga of The Conqueror. His last public appearance at the Academy Awards a few months earlier showed his frail appearance and caused rumors that the Duke was dying of cancer. That's just about the only medicine a fella would ever really need. Believe me when I tell you that I'm mighty pleased that I can't amble down here tonight. Ironically enough, five years earlier, John Wayne's co-star from The Conqueror, Susan Hayward, would also make her final appearance at the Oscars. After battles against a host of cancers, it was discovered that she had some 20 brain tumors growing inside her, causing headaches, seizures, and loss of control of her body. They would ultimately take her life in 1975. Co-star Agnes Moorhead succumbed to cancer in 1974, and supporting actor Pedro Armendariz would commit suicide after learning his terminal cancer in 1963. And Dick Powell, the film's director, lost his battle with cancer in 1963. In fact, more than 95 members of the cast and crew would battle cancer in the years after the film, many losing that battle. If there was one event that signals the turning point in the entire saga surrounding the Conqueror, it is perhaps the atomic blast of Harry in 1953. This single event would be a lightning rod or ground zero of all the events that would follow. The problematic blast would become known as Dirty Harry because of the problems it encountered. For the Atomic Energy Commission, the blast of Harry represented a learning event. While the AEC would promote atomic testing as a program headed by knowledgeable and expert resources, this was more public relations than practice. In reality, the government scientists knew how to construct these weapons of mass destruction and prove so in ending World War II by annihilating Japan, but yet they lacked the knowledge of how the blasts themselves would impact their surroundings. As for the community of St. George, Snow Canyon would play a vital role as the collection point for the fallout from Harry. A change in the direction of the winds as Harry was detonated put the radioactive debris on a collision course with the community. Would the government have changed its plans for Harry had they known of this change in the weather is unclear. What is clear is that each detonation was approved only at the last minute as long as the winds were directing fallout away from major metropolises like Las Vegas and Los Angeles. While the government didn't know the full impact these blasts would play on the communities living in their path, they knew it wasn't going to be healthy to spray radioactive waste across a major U.S. city and populations. What acceptable level of casualties was permitted may never be known, but they would limit risk by setting blasts off when fallout would drop in sparsely populated areas. The government would then advise those in danger to stay indoors, wash down their cars, and rewash the laundry left hanging on their clotheslines during the blast. It's estimated that more than half the bomb debris settled within 24 hours, suggesting much of the Harry blast fell within the St. George and surrounding areas, including Snow Canyon, in the immediate hours after detonation. While fallout radiation decays exponentially, the government felt that most areas were fairly safe from detonation within three to five weeks after the explosion. But that wasn't completely true. Harry was not your usual blast. The explosion was much closer to the ground than expected, pulling up massive amounts of debris and dirt into its fireball. Not all of the debris vaporized, and what remained became contaminated with radioactive isotopes. This debris was then deposited in clumps across the region in the hours and days after. Scientists understood that radioactive debris would decay over time, but they were never completely sure of the long-term effects from the continued exposure to what each blast left behind. 
While some would be harmless within a matter of seconds, other debris would remain dangerous for years. The concept of half-life was defined to indicate the level of potency of a radioactive substance. Its half-life is time it takes for the radioactive levels to fall by half. Dirty Harry was a 32 kiloton bomb detonated atop a 300-foot tower. The tower was a miscalculation by experts when the explosion pulled vast amounts of debris into the blast. In fact, it vaporized the tower itself and sucked up everything in its immediate radius into the mushroom cloud. Some of the debris became fine radioactive powder and formed small clumps when traveled downwind, settling across the St. George, Utah area, largely in nearby Snow Canyon which acted as a natural reservoir for fallout because of the surrounding mountains. Some estimates put fallout doses of iodine-131 in the St. George area at 136 to 500 times higher than normal depending upon where one stood. Iodine-131 has been known to cause mutation and death in cells it penetrates and has been linked to increased risk of thyroid cancer. Researchers found high rates of the cancer in the region downwind of the Nevada test site in the years that followed atomic testing. For Harry, many people were reportedly not warned in advance. After the blast, the hides of deer, horses, and cattle in the area show burn marks, and dead wildlife was noted across the landscape. Many who happened to be there that day complained of symptoms that indicated exposure to high doses of radiation. Headaches, fever, dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, hair loss, discoloration of fingernails, and burns, among others, were not uncommon for those in Harry's path. The explosion didn't simply end within 24 hours after the blast, or in a few days and weeks after the fallout and debris settled. Continued exposure to waste left behind on the earth, as well as the plants and animals in the region, meant there were hazards from inhaling fallout particles into the lungs or from drinking milk produced by cows gazing, grazing in the area or consuming meat and vegetables grown in the region. The Conqueror was intended to be Howard Hughes' crowning achievement of epic proportions and Dick Powell's chance to achieve major success as a respected director. John Wayne was the number one box office star at the time. He owed RKO a film as part of a multi-picture deal and chose The Conqueror as the final film in his contract. Actor Dick Powell saw the film as a chance to expand his career and work with location scouts to find the best location. Searching across eight states to represent the Gobi Desert, someone suggested Utah may make a suitable locale. Powell was delighted with the red sand and fantastic rock formations. Clearing away any signs of civilization, Snow Canyon would be the prime location. Nearby St. George would be the center of the action for running the local production and housing the cast and crew. The entire town of St. George, Utah had a chance to forget about the troubles of atomic fallout in mid-1954 when the cast and crew of The Conqueror began arriving on location for filming. Director Dick Powell and location scouts reportedly armed themselves with Geiger counters to test the radiation levels in the canyon prior to allowing any of the crew or cast to begin work. But government experts assured them that the location was completely safe and the radiation levels were within allowed ranges. But no one really knew what the levels were, considering that the most recent three blasts alone, including Dirty Harry, combined to more than eight times the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II. Amid the controversy of atomic testing and daily visits and warnings by the AEC, to the community, news that a major motion picture would be filmed in their local surroundings gave the residents of St. George reason to be happy. In addition to a visit from major Hollywood stars like John Wayne and Susan Hayward, the production meant a great business opportunity for the local community. In addition to the influx of money spent by the cast and crew in the town during the month-plus stay, the filming also meant work for many locals. Filming would take place between June and August 1954. An employment office was set up in St. George's hardware store, and the local high school was used to house wardrobe as well as the makeup department. The school cafeteria was put to use for serving meals, and those interested in temporary jobs were able to apply for work ranging from serving hot lunches to the crew to helping the production 
and even playing a role as extra in during many of the fight scenes. Many St. George residents were cast in the picture, and Indians from the local reservation were hired as horsemen. Those hired were paid $10 a day's work, $12 if they were hired to ride a horse, and if they waited on set all day and were not needed, they were still paid $4 a day. As for John Wayne's preparation for filming The Conqueror, some biographers suggest he never actually picked up a script for the film until he arrived on location. But when he did, he immediately became concerned because of the difficult dialogue he had to learn for the 12th century warrior. But by then it was too late to rewrite the script. But the ever-professional Wayne settled in to do the best he could with the situation. A lot of people were depending on him. While the dialogue was one issue, he reportedly prepared for the action sequences as well by having fencing lessons in preparation for the role. The glorious red dirt of Snow Canyon and its lack of power lines and civilization made it the perfect location for the 12th century desert. And while the winds were often strong enough to create fantastic sandstorms to enhance the action, the crew brought in several huge electric wind blowers to generate additional wind when needed. With normal summer temperatures topping 100 degrees, some days the temperatures exceeded 120 degrees, making for sweltering work days for anyone involved in the production or living in the nearby community. Director Dick Powell wore a surgical mask while he was up in the camera boom to keep the dirt and sand from getting into his nose and mouth. But the sand was everywhere, and the cast and crew began to refer to it as Utah chili powder. The producers installed showers on the set so the cast and crew could rinse off the grime, but once they returned to filming, the sand and dirt would be back and cast and crew would be covered in it. It would get into their eyes, nostrils, mouths, skin, and food. The red sand was called a plague. It got into everything and clung to the skin. After its release in 1956, the Conqueror would suffer poor reviews and be called one of the biggest casting blunders of all time. But the impact would follow the casting crew like a dark cloud of pain and agony. John Wayne would move on from the film, as would others, but as the years ticked by, cancer would become a common theme threaded throughout the casting crew. In addition to Wayne, Hayward, Moorhead, Armanderas, and Powell, other cancer deaths included co-stars Tomas Gomez, Lee Van Cleef, John Hoyt, Gene Gershon, and stuntmen Chuck Robertson and Bernie Gozier. Of the 223 people on the film, at least 95 battled cancer in the years after filming. Lawsuits, hearing, and legislation would drag on for years at last until the Radiation Compensation Act of 1990 was signed to provide compensation for citizens injured by radioactive fallout from nuclear testing on U.S. soil. And by 1992, the United States announced it would put nuclear weapons testing on hold indefinitely. The Radiation Exposure Compensation Act allowed for people living downwind of the Nevada test site for at least two years in Nevada, Arizona, or Utah counties to be compensated for their suffering. Residents of the region between January 21, 1951 and October 31, 1958 or June 30, 1962, and July 31, 1962, who required certain forms of cancer or other serious illnesses that were deemed to be caused by fallout, were able to receive compensation as high as $50,000. As of January 2006, more than 10,500 claims had been approved. Roughly 3,000 claims were rejected. Since then, more than $525 million in compensation has been paid. The cast and crew of The Conqueror would not be eligible for the compensation, but it probably didn't matter because by then most of the cast and crew were already dead.